Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide toll free 800 610 7035. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And our main website, www.exxonradiotv.com. My guest this hour is Gail Z. Martin. She is the author of the new epic fantasy, Reign of Ash, which is published by Orbit Books, and Deadly Curiosities, a new urban fantasy novel that is published by Solaris. Uh, it's set in Charleston, South Carolina. She is also the author of Ice Forged in the Ascendant Kingdoms saga, War of the Shadows, and Iron and Blood. Uh, which are books that she has published over the last couple of years. Now, uh, she is the author of the Chronicles of the Necromancer series, The Summoner, The Blood King, Dark Haven, and Lady, Dark Lady's Chosen, which were published by Solaris Books, and The Fallen King Cycle, The Sworn, and The Dread from Orbit Books. She writes two series of e-book short stories, including the John Mark... Van Hanian Adventures and the Deadly Curiosities Adventures. Her website, www.deadlycuriosities.com. And Gail, welcome back to the Exxon after all these years. Well, I'm thrilled to be back. Well, we're so happy you're back. You are one busy lady. <laughs> well, there are a lot of stories to tell, so, you know, I just have to keep at it. I have to ask you, where do you get the inspiration for all your stories? You know, it, it comes from everything I do. If I go to a museum, mm-hmm. I'm going to see something there that, that just begs for a story. Uh, sometimes just going to, um, I, I love to go to historic cities, and there'll be a monument, there'll be a story that I hear about something that happened in history, and I'll go, oh, I can use that. Uh, and sometimes they're just odd things that happen from my real life that I just push into a little more of the X zone, so to speak, and yeah. take them a little yeah. stranger. And, uh, well, you know, there you go. It, it, what's your most favorite historic city? Oh, you know, that's really tough um, because I love Charleston. And Beautiful. that's why yeah. I decided to, to set Deadly Curiosities there. Uh, but, you know, New Orleans is gorgeous, uh, Williamsburg, Virginia is gorgeous, and, uh, you know, don't even get me started on places like London and Rome and Edinburgh. I mean, you know, they're just too many to count. Wow. Sounds like you love traveling. I do. And every place I go, I'm a sucker for museums. Um, you know, I am just <laughs> happy as can yeah. be with a couple of hours to wander around at a museum, and I'll always find the... the weirdest, most unusual, most macabre stuff in, on their, on exhibit. I love museums as well. Whenever Laura and I go traveling, uh, she knows that if I need to... She loves shopping. That's her thing. My thing is is museums and historical sites. So our deal is, I'll go with you if you come with me. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, and you know, I, I do a lot of traveling mm-hmm. with the books, and so whenever I can fit in an extra half day or so because, you know, I've had to come in a day early anyhow. Yeah. Um, you, you'll find me on a tour somewhere or in a museum if I can if I can get there. What kind of museums do you like? Do you like the historic museums, the art museums, the anthropological museums, the archaeological museums, or do you just like museums, period? I just like museums, period. You know, I was in Washington, D.C. earlier this year for a, a science fiction convention, and I I had some extra time. Mm -hmm. So I was making my way down toward the Smithsonian buildings, and I passed the International Spy Museum. Now, who can pass that up? No one I know. And they had a... Then they had a James Bond exhibit, you know, so I had to go in there and, and of course, got several new ideas for things as well. But uh, sometimes those fun museums that are the little quirky mm-hmm. uh, ones 
can can really be someplace you're going to see something that you just won't find anywhere else. Well, all right, Money Penny, we've got to take a commercial <laughs> break here. The James Bond Museum. Wow, that would be an idea. But a spy museum. Of course, where else would you have a spy museum except in Washington? Makes perfect mm-hmm. sense. You and Absolutely. I have. You and I have to take our commercial break uh, for this uh, segment, my dear. Please stand by. Exxon Nation, Gail Z. Martin is my special guest. And uh, her website is www.deadlycuriosities.com. That's www.deadlycuriosities.com. She also uh, does tweet lives at, uh, at Gail Z. Martin. That's at Gail Z. Martin. Jeez, I'll get Twitter right one of these days. We'll be back (laughs) on the other side of this commercial break in two minutes as we continue with our special guest this hour, Gail Z. Martin. So whatever you do, Exxon Nation, don't go away because we have a lot in store for you this hour right here in the Exxon. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. Gail Z. Martin is our special guest this hour. Her website is www.deadlycuriosities.com. Gail, what got you interested in the supernatural and the paranormal? You know, I've been interested in it for as long as I can remember. When I was a kid, we went on vacation one year, and I picked up this book of um, regional ghost stories Mm. from the Adirondack region where we were on vacation. And I I think I read that book until the cover fell off. You know, it was all these recounting of people's tales for seeing the ghost on the bridge or the ghost in the the old house and all that. And and I just loved it. And I went out looking for more of them. And I think ever since then, I have been uh, totally entranced with finding out, you know, what what's really out there and hearing people's stories of what they've seen. You yourself, have you had any paranormal or supernatural uh, events? You know, I haven't, which is kind of odd hmm. because of how long I've been interested in it, but I seem to attract a lot of friends and people around me who have, you know, uh, some, some pretty well-proven uh, capabilities in that direction. So a lot of my friends are psychics or clairvoyants or have, um, you know, had had a pretty strong sixth sense. So maybe I'm just a magnet for that. So how do you how do you use supernatural and or paranormal events in your writings? Well, uh, my characters all work with some level of magic, and of course uh. it differs by series. So my Chronicles of the Necromancer series, I've got a necromancer who is actually the good guy, Uh, somebody who has the power to intercede between the living and the dead and can raise ghosts and speak with them and uh, interact. So that was a really interesting um, capability to deal with because most of the time when you see a necromancer in epic fantasy, they're they're the bad guy, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, bringing forth the legions of the undead. And in this case, you've got somebody who's who's trying to deal with a major magical power and really sweating some of the the ethics and the morality of it and and what what can he do, what should he do, and uh, how does that play into all the rest of the politics and, and the dire circumstances. So that was a lot of fun. So if you yourself have not had a paranormal supernatural experience, why do you believe I think that the world is a wonderful place full of mysteries, and I don't think we've figured them all out yet. Um, I have enough friends who have told me about their firsthand experiences. I've read enough about people's firsthand experiences to believe that there are things out there we just don't understand. And we may, you know be digging for a while here to figure out what really causes them, but they're out there, and they happen, and I don't think 
the, the question is, have they happened? The question is, well, what made them happen and what's the cause? And, and that's where I'm intrigued. All right. You're, you're at your house with a group of your friends. And one of your friends starts telling you a story. Have, has any of their stories ever just made the hair on the back of your neck stand up? And if so, can you share the story with us? Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of my friends who is very active with um, with a ghost hunting group, they go out and try to document the supernatural mm-hmm. activity at, at places that are haunted, um, told me about her first experience. And she was a teenager and she went over to visit a friend. A friend lived in, you know, an old Victorian house. And uh, she went sat on the couch while her friend went into the kitchen to get them a soda. Mm-hmm. And an old lady came from the hallway, walked into the living room stopped at the edge of the couch and looked at her and then turned around to walk out. And as she walked out, my friend realized that the woman didn't have a lower half to her body, and then she just disappeared. Oh, my gosh. And and yet when she was coming toward my friend, it never occurred to her that this wasn't just, you know, somebody's grandmother. Mm Mm-hmm. And when she, when her friend came back from the kitchen, she told her what happened. She said, oh, yeah, that's, that's my grandmother. She just passed. So nonchalantly. Yeah, yeah. And, and I hear those kinds of stories all the time, and I'm just fascinated with them and, and always have been. Um, so I, I love touring haunted places. I love going on graveyard tours. I, I'll be doing that in in New Orleans here and, and also in Charleston. Um, but uh, at least at least for now, I'm just going to have to settle for secondhand stories. Well, you know what? I, I, I respect ghost, uh, ghost organizers, ghost tour operators, uh, researchers, because what they are doing in essence is they keep history alive. Mm-hmm. They're the greatest historians we have. Oh, they are. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think... In my mind, I, I really make a distinction between the people like my friend who are going out there and trying to document what is actually going on at mm-hmm. sites where there have been unexplained uh, phenomenon. And, and some of the very hyped stuff you see on TV oh, where gosh, yeah. you've really got a half hour of people with green light going, did you hear that? What was that? <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of silly. Although I have to admit from time to time, I'll get suckered in and watch them. I've got to tell you something. I, I used to watch it, but I don't anymore because it's so hokey. Like, yeah. like if I ever decided to do a, a ghost uh, series with what I know, my lord, you know. But I, I don't believe the public should be suckered into believing anything. If you're going to do it, do it right. Let them decide. If you're going to show them something, don't stage it. Don't fake it, because the credible ghost. Researchers will tell you that the majority of time, nothing happens. It's just like on a police surveillance. You sit and wait, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks, until something happens. Like you, I, I've never known a, a, a ghost case that is completed in 22 minutes that's shot in one day. It doesn't work like that. No, no, and it makes people have very unrealistic expectations Mm -hmm. that if they are having something unusual happening in their home or in their place of business, that somebody is going to just be able to come out and it's like having Terminex in, you know, oh, there's the roach, we'll get it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. And then you've got the other side of the spectrum where where movies like Ghostbusters, like that was a hoot, you know, Mm -hmm. And, and I understand that both the the genres, whether they're far off the wall or if they're comedies, are certainly bringing an awareness to the to the paranormal and the supernatural, which is good. However, I think that people should really further investigate and filter what they're believing and what they're not believing, because I still talk to people on a daily basis who say, hey, listen, I know it's true because I read it on the Internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like um, some of those old ghost stories you'd see in Fate magazine yeah. or, or the National Enquirer, and they make a good story. You know, I used to enjoy reading my grandmother's copies of, of Fate magazine when I was a kid, but, wow. you know, some of the real stuff is a lot creepier. It, it is. It is. And, uh, you know, like you were talking earlier about your love for museums, 
And I've gone to the museums here in Ontario, and when we've traveled abroad, I've gone to the different museums. And just let, I'm sure you do the same thing, that you start visualizing what you're looking at as if a little movie is playing in your mind. And I'll tell you, that to me can be a lot more spookier than any ghost that may pop up. Because when you're looking at something four or five hundred years old, it brings with it a lot of memories and it brings a lot of challenges that we as a human race have faced over the years. Well, and that's really where I think my idea for the Deadly Curiosity mm-hmm. series came from, because the, the main character, Cassidy, is a psychometric. She can read objects by touch if they have a lot of emotional impact behind them. And if you think of the objects that are in your average museum, they're all there because they were witness to something major in exactly. history, often something tragic. Mm-hmm. Those have got to carry a lot of psychic baggage with them. And so Cassidy is able to sort some of that out, and and especially where there's a supernatural malevolent presence uh, connected to that object, then she and her team take over to uh, basically uh, keep the world safe. So what was your inspiration for writing um, Deadly Curiosities? Well, a couple of things. One is um, I I was on a business trip to Charleston, Mm -hmm. and I just fell in love with the city. It's so gorgeous. The architecture, the history, you know, it's just a gorgeous city. And as I was walking around, I was thinking, you know, I can't think of a an urban fantasy series that's been set in Charleston. There there are a lot of them in New Orleans. There are Mm -hmm. some in all the other major cities. And uh, I thought, well, you know, maybe I had to do something about that. And then as I looked around and thought, well, okay, so if I were going to set a series in Charleston, what seem to be the natural connections to the city? And having Cassidy um, be the most recent proprietor of Trifles and Folly, which is a 350-year-old antique and curio shop that exists to get dangerous magical items off the market, just seemed to be the kind of thing that would fit seamlessly into a city like Charleston. I love it. It's a great, uh, it's a great concept, a great idea. How long did it take you to write? Once I, it took about, I guess, a year and a half from the time I first got the idea to get the go ahead, you know, with the publisher that yeah we had a publisher for mm-hmm. it and and uh, to run with it and then to get the book uh, written. But it was just a a lot of fun because it was a very big departure from the epic fantasy that I've done. Uh, epic fantasy is all third person a much longer book, about 650 pages on average. Urban fantasy is first person. Of course, it's it's contemporary. Sure. And it's a, it's a shorter book. So there's some um, very different stylistic pieces. And it was, it was a challenge to see, hey, you know, I've got this story I want to tell, and it's got to be in a whole different format. And that was part of the fun. You and I have to take our commercial break at the bottom of the hour with their, with the news, Gail. Please stand by. Exonation, my guest this hour, is a lady that we've had the pleasure of having on the show before. Her name is Gail Z. Martin, and she's the author of the new epic fantasy series, um, Reign of Ash, and also Deadly Curiosities. And if you'd like to find out more information about Gail, where you can buy her books... And a lot more. Visit our website at www.deadlycuriosities.com. That's www.deadlycuriosities.com. And uh, Gail will be back with me on the other side of this news break as we continue here in our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And we reach around the world on the Exxon Broadcast Network and our growing family of broadcast affiliates and satellite programming providers. My name is Rob McConnell. I'll be back with Gail Martin on the other side of this news break. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. Gail Z. Martin is my special guest this hour, and uh, her website is www.deadlycuriosities.com. Gail, when you're picking a paranormal or supernatural topic for one of your books, what kind of research do you do in order to get it so right? Well, you know, 
know, I, I do have a lot of friends who have uh, paranormal and clairvoyant uh, mm -hmm. capabilities. So a lot of times, you know, I'll talk with them, and especially if I am trying to investigate what it's like to have a certain kind of information revealed, how they, um, how they feel, I'll, I'll go to them. Um, I also read quite extensively, and um, I'm, I'm always interested in any kind of a recap about paranormal activity because anything I can find, especially from credible sources, people who are the real deal, who are out there working with it, that's what informs me. Plus, you know, a fair amount of just intuition. Um, I've, I've been told by a number of folks who do have those abilities that I, I describe it spot on mm -hmm. from their experience. So I'm, I'm do, I guess I'm guessing right. I think it's that you're doing a lot of research, right, and making sure that everything is is dead on because that's what kind of author you are. Well, absolutely. You know, I, I do want to get it right. Mm -hmm. I do want to show respect for people who have uh, par paranormal and clairvoyant capabilities. And I think that the research and uh, interviewing people, talking with people, listening and always looking for the details mm -hmm. is, is how you create that sense of reality. But you said something very important there, is you listen. And not very many people in the world today actually listen. Their idea of communication is a one-way street, my way or no way. Well, you know, that, that really doesn't lead to good outcomes. I, I agree. I agree 100%. <laughs> And I think a lot of what I also try to do is to use my own intuition and imagination and say, if I had this capability in this situation, mm -hmm. what would it feel like? What would I be doing? And really be able to empathize in that way. And I, I think that that's a key piece. How has the reading public's acceptance of the paranormal and supernatural themes changed over the years? I think it's changed tremendously. You know, years ago, um, as I said, I've, I've always loved books about the supernatural mm -hmm. and paranormal. And, and years ago, they were hard to find. You know, you might have uh, In Search of Ancient Astronauts, but that was kind of tinfoil sort of material. And uh, now there are supernatural elements in everything. Yeah. It's gone very mainstream. It's all over TV and HBO. And uh, I think that that makes people much more open to possibilities, and that's a good thing. What's the hardest part about being an author in today's society? Um, you know, people always ask you, when are you getting the movie deal? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, well, that's wonderful when, when, you know, and if that does happen. Um, I hope that we always value books because they are just wonderful portals to other worlds. How has the advent of uh, e-books changed the publishing business, in your opinion? Um, you know, it's given us uh, another way to experience books, and especially mm -hmm. for those of us who travel, it can be very nice to not have to uh, carry a lot of heavy books with us on a plane or something. Um, I think it's also made it easier for a lot of out-of-print books to come back into availability, and we're seeing mm. that, which is just a fantastic thing. And, of course, with e-books, it's made it uh, very feasible for a lot more material to come into the marketplace. And, uh, you know, some of that is, is great stuff. Some of it maybe not so much, but it's a, it's a renaissance in availability that is, just really amazing. In your opinion, as an established author, what are the pros and cons, in your opinion, between self-publishing and going with a publisher? Well, publishing is a, is a weird and wonderful world, and going with a traditional publisher um, often, not always, but often, uh, can mean some money up front. Mm -hmm. um, that's an advance. And then, uh, of course, working with people who take care of the details like uh, getting the cover art and putting the uh, book together so that it's laid out attractively and making those really important deals to get the books into bookstores and, and, out, um, and, and out into the public and doing the marketing in many ways that, that authors 
have difficulty doing themselves. Uh, on the other hand, you know, with self-publishing, it's possible to bring material out that might have a small enough niche audience that a traditional publisher wouldn't find it profitable, but a uh, large enough interest segment that an independent uh, author can still do quite well off the proceeds. I actually uh, have a foot in, in both camps. I publish my main series with large traditional New York and London publishers, but my two series of ebooks, John Mark Fahanian Adventures and The Deadly Curiosities Adventures, we bring out each month, my husband and I, uh, ourselves, direct to Kindle, Kobo, and Nook. Wow. What advice would you have for anyone listening tonight who wants to become or believes they have the story of stories and they want to get it out there? Well, I think don't give up. Um, just keep on writing. The more you write, mm -hmm. the better you'll get at writing. And so that's a key thing is keep on writing. But, you know, there's some wonderful, very accessible materials out there. I always steer new writers toward Writer's Digest books. They have a library of books on how to get published, how to mm -hmm. prepare the manuscript, how to do a good job with things like dialogue and character and plot. And if you take the time to educate yourself on those basics and then keep writing and don't give up, it'll break through for you. So how does somebody know if they have the story that everyone will love to read or it's a story that they themselves are the only people who really like it? Like, is there any testing grounds where a publisher or an author can send their work to get an honest outside opinion? Well, you know, a lot of folks start by circulating their stories to a trusted group of friends. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that may not get you entirely unbiased feedback, but it does give you some very relevant feedback uh, if you pick the right people, people who will tell you, hey, you know, I really like the idea, but uh, I got a little slow in the middle there. Yeah. And, and now you know what to fix. Um, there are writers groups that specialize in getting together every month, and everybody brings a couple of pages, and they read them aloud, and they get feedback. That can be a wonderful thing. Same kind of thing happens online. There are some uh, vibrant writing communities that exist to help um, groups of people connect with each other and support each other and encourage each other by giving helpful critiques of their writing. And you just have to find which one works for you so that you're getting the kind of feedback you can use to make your writing better. I don't imagine anyone who can't take criticism would be a very good author. No, there's a lot of criticism, a lot of feedback, uh, a lot of rejection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of that criticism is, thing, it is valid. It's stuff yeah. you need to know uh, all along the way. Um, you know, no matter how many books you have published, your editor's still going to send you back comments on the manuscript and say, you know, I think you need to touch this up here and there. And, it, you know, you have to be able to step back from it and say, wow, you know what, I, I thought I had it perfect, but you're right, it would be even better if I did that. So what, in your opinion, makes a good book? I want to feel like I have opened a door into another world mm. and that I am I'm having an adventure with real people. And to me, the mark of a great book is when I close the book and I feel sad because I'm not going to be spending time with those people anymore. Well, that's that's a very unique way of looking at it. Yeah. So, so how do you, as an author, deal with what everybody knows as a writer's block? How do you get past that? Fortunately, knock on wood, I don't run into that mm -hmm. a lot. Um, but we're also doing three books a year plus a short story every month. Wow. And this year I also contributed to nine anthologies. Um, so that, that's a huge amount of, of pages and, and words. It is. And it is. I'm very fortunate that my husband's come into the business with me in the last several years, and he plays a very important behind-the-scenes role. And with the new steampunk book next year, Iron and Blood, he'll be uh, my official co-author. But when I do get to a point where I go, okay, I, I need a fight scene here, and this is how it's got to end, 
but I'm a little muddled in the middle, we can sit down and have a cup of coffee, and, and he's turned into a terrific uh, brainstorming partner on this. So I don't stay stuck for long. Wow. So how long does it, you know, from the time you get the idea to the time it comes, you get the, the finished book in your hand, the published book in your hand, how long does it take you usually? I'm not talking about the e-books um, here. I'm not talking about e-books. It can take anywhere from about six months to about a year. Mm. But, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have had books that it was six months from the time I turned in the final version of the manuscript to when it showed up on the shelves. And, and to me, that is almost like magic because there's so much that has to happen to bring a print book into the world and then have it on everybody's Barnes & Noble shelf or Indigo shelf. Uh, you know, <laughs> that to me is magic. Tell me, what was it like the first time you walked into a, a brick-and-mortar bookstore and saw your book on the shelf? Uh, you know, for years, and I'm, I'm talking decades, I had wanted to see my book on that shelf. And every time I would go to the bookstore, I would go to the place where the M's were on the mm -hmm. shelf and I would move them aside and I would put my hand in that empty spot and I would close my eyes and I would picture my hand on the spine of a book with my name on it. And so when the summoner came out and I walked into the bookstore and I didn't have to imagine anymore, it was there. I, I, I jumped up and down. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> did you buy, did you uh, buy I, a copy? Well, I, I, you know, authors get author copies from mm -hmm. uh, the publisher, sure. so I didn't have to. I didn't have to buy it there, but I have occasionally, you know, been buying books at a bookstore, and when I go to check out, occasionally somebody will take a double ch double take at the name on the credit card and go, you know, you've got the same name as one of, and that's no, that's wow. me, honest. Fascinating. <laughs> that's always kind of thrilling. Yeah, it know? is. I, I remember the first issue of the X Chronicles newspaper going back to 1993 that came out. And we were shopping, and uh, the X Chronicles was it's it was distributed at the time through one of the major grocery chains in the, in the newsstand. And I was so thrilled. I actually bought the newspaper. <laughs> and I still have it today with that receipt in a clear plastic vacuumed air pack uh, envelope and to me it was so thrilling you know here it was my newspaper i published it and yet i had to buy it because it was in a store <laughs> so i understand the feeling that you have and i don't know it it makes it all worthwhile oh it does and and you know it, it's even more worthwhile when you get the emails you get the, mm -hmm. the facebook messages from people who your book got them through a tough time yeah. and maybe that yeah. was uh, sitting at a bedside for somebody at the hospital, or I've, I've had so many um, emails and, and Facebook messages from guys in the service who are someplace really dangerous, yeah. and their break from a pretty awful reality is that they get to lose themselves in a book. And I am so honored and so privileged to um, be able to tell them stories that make it better. So what's next for you? Are you going to get that movie deal? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I would love to. Movie, HBO, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, my, my phone is, uh, my phone line is open. Um, but uh, we're under contract for three uh, addition, three more books next year. So that'll mm -hmm. be an epic fantasy um, and an urban fantasy and the new steampunk story. Uh, we'll be bringing out uh, a new short story every month. And they're already starting to be some new anthology projects. And so uh, it's it's a good deal. I'm I'm thrilled. I'm getting to write stories, and that's what has been my lifelong dream. How do you, as an author, see the line between books that are fiction and books about the paranormal theories, or or observed phenomenon? Well, again, I think if somebody is trying to the best of their ability to write a a factual recounting mm -hmm. of what they have experienced what they have seen, um, then to me that's legitimate. Um, I worry when things are a little too pat and I feel like somebody has fictionalized something yeah. without, uh, without telling me that. It makes a great story, but at some point we've crossed that line from journalistic observation to, you know, writing the Blair Witch Project. And I do want to know 
where that line is from observed phenomenon to, and we've jazzed this up to make it a good story. And so many authors do that. So many. Well, they do, and it, it's kind of like um, people who write a memoir, and all of a sudden they're they're recounting conversations word for word that happened 30 years ago. Now, nobody's memory is that good. Um, so you know that some of that has been fictionalized or embellished because mm-hmm. unless you walked around with a tape recorder, you don't have all of those details at your fingertips. Gail, stand by. You and I have to take our final break for this hour. Exonation. Gail Z. Martin is our special guest this hour. Her website is www.deadlycuriosities.com. That's www.deadlycuriosities.com. Now, I'll be back with Gail on the other side of this break as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon that's coming to you worldwide from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. www.deadlycuriosities.com is the website where you can get more information on our special guest this hour, Gail Z. Martin. And Gail, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here in the Exxon tonight. Well, thank you so much for having me. We always have a great conversation. Yes, yes we do. Uh, what are the final words you'd like to leave with the Exxon Nation tonight? Well, you know, I uh, I think just keep on observing, keep on uh, looking for what's out there because, uh, yeah, Scully and Muldoor had it right. The truth is out there, and there's a lot we don't know, and isn't the mystery wonderful? Tell me an uh, off-the-cuff question here. Do you think the governments of the world are suppressing information on UFOs? <laughs> Well, I think governments in general suppress all kinds of stuff, whether it's on UFOs or Mm -hmm. not. I don't know. But, uh, you know, it wouldn't be the oddest thing in the world. Who knows? Tell me, do you believe in aliens? And I mean the ones from (laughs) outer space, not from Mexico. (laughs) I think it's a very, very big universe out Mm -hmm. there, and I'd be surprised if we were all alone in it. So uh, I'm not not ruling anything out. Funny. So when's your next book coming out? Well, um, the next book is War of Shadows. comes out in uh, April of 2015. And then Iron and Blood comes out in July 2015. And the second Deadly Curiosities book will come out in November of next year. Wow. So you've already planned a year ahead. Oh, yeah. And and they're written. So. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So Got to you, keep ahead of the curve. I, I guess so. I guess so. Gail, as always, a great pleasure talking to you. Once again, thanks very much for uh, joining us tonight. And tell our listeners where they can get copies of your book. And once again, give them your website. Sure. Uh, my books are in bookstores everywhere. So you can find me in uh, Indigos and Waterstones and uh, Barnes & Noble and on Amazon, of course, on Kindle, Kobo, and Nook. And uh, you can catch up with me and everything that's coming up on DeadlyCuriosities.com. Gail, take care of yourself. My regards to your your husband. And I look forward to the next time you join us back here in the X-Zone. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Good night, Gail. Exonation, my guest this hour has been Gail Z. Martin. Once again, her website is www.deadlycuriosities.com. That's www.deadlycuriosities.com. Now, I'll be back on the other side of the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as we continue here in the Exxon with yours truly, Rob McConnell. Whatever you do, don't go away. We'll be right back. Oh, oh, oh. 